Okay, welcome to you all. You have chosen the geology major uh, in the concentration of, of uh, presentations in the morning here. And so I wanted to introduce you to the faculty for the geology major. Uh, there's myself, Kurt Wise, but I wanted to start with uh, uh, Steve Austin, is uh, uh, the father of our group. He's dad. <laughs> uh, that's because uh, Steve Austin was the very first young age creationist to earn a PhD in geology, and that occurred in 1979. Uh, his focus, uh, uh, the focus of research is in what we call soft rock geology. Uh, it studies rocks that are softer than the other rocks, so sedimentary rocks, sandstone shales, uh, coal, uh, all of these sorts of things. Uh, that's, that's his uh, area of concentration and expertise. Uh, we've also created a creation geology society for creation geologists, for young age creation geologists. Steve is the president of that society. Um, in addition, we've got uh, Andrew Snelling. Uh, Andrew received his doctorate in 1983. I didn't want my career. It, you, <laughs> I, I, I assumed you would know. Not, <laughs> <so I'll laughs> Two years after uh, Steve received his doctorate, then Andrew received his doctorate in hard rock geology, so studying uh, metamorphic rocks, igneous rocks, and that sort of thing, things that require substantially stronger uh, hammers than, uh, than the soft rock area. And I earned my doctorate in 1989, a number of years later, in uh, paleontology, study of fossils. So between the three of us, we span not all, but a significant part of the, uh, the, the various sub-disciplines of geology. Uh, and so it's, uh, it, we're going to be tag-teaming throughout, uh, throughout the week here, and perhaps interacting with each other as, as we go along, I hope be fun. Uh, so I thought I'd introduce you to uh, the folks that are, that are going to be in front of you. Okay, okay. thanks guys. <laughs> okay, I, and, and what I wanted to do uh, to start us out in thinking about what, what should somebody know uh, who's, let's say, starting from ground zero in creation geology. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to do this first day, we're going to look at a model of Earth history that uh, has been developed, and the three of us were part of the development of that model. Uh, and I, I do that because, one, it's really cool. Uh, number two, why it's first, why we start this way. Uh, number two, it, I believe it's a good starting uh, synthetic starting model to understand all, ultimately all of creation geology. Uh, it's going to have to be worked on an awful lot. The, towards the end of this uh, week, we're going to talk about the areas we need. We need a lot of work, uh, where we need the work. But I wanted to start with the success of the model, and even before laying out the model, which is which Steve is going to do for you. Uh, I wanted to introduce the secular model, uh, which has become popular in, in geology, uh, for explaining the geology of the world, and why it's, it's really a cool model, too. It's amazing in its explanatory power, and I think it's very important you understand how very powerful this model is. So let's see if I can figure out how to work this thing. Okay. The model is plate tectonics. I'd love to give you more details than I'm going to give you, but I'm, I, I like the historical overview, for example. It was uh, just a little over 100 years ago that uh, this model, at least one piece of this model, was first introduced by a person who focused on weather, uh, who introduced the idea that continents moved on this planet. Wow, that was a wild idea. And it took a long time to... Uh, to be accepted, in fact, if you ignored the rest of the world and just focused on the United States, it would take 50 years for that model to be accepted. It was accepted basically around the world long before that, decades before that. But it took the uniting of that model, called continental drift hypothesis, with another model of seafloor spreading. When those two things were put together and a prediction was made in 1964, 
that's when the U.S. scientists, U.S. geologists, uh, came on board because the power of the model became uh, really irresistible. There's no way you could not believe in plate tectonics, but it was, in a sense, a revolution in the field. And I wanted to go over the the reason why I would suggest this this theory is uh, very, very powerful. It's got great explanatory power. I'm going to start with what the theory is. And this is after we put the two pieces together, the moving continents and the seafloor spreading, to create the theory of plate tectonics. This is basically the idea of the theory. Uh, that is that the continents on the, uh, in the world move uh, horizontally across the surface of the Earth, floating on top of the mantle of the Earth, especially the very uppermost portion of the mantle is thought to be semi-liquid almost, and the continents can slide across on top of that. The, but what, it isn't that the continents themselves are self-driven, it's, it's, there's actually motion inside the mantle that the continents are just coming on, going along for the ride. Uh, the idea is there is a conveyor belt of motion inside the Earth. Uh, the, there's a horizontal component of it that is moving the continents across the planet, and then there's another portion of it that goes into the Earth and returns, creating cycles uh, or uh, circular motions of the Earth's um, upper mantle. And in the process, it... Okay, yeah, right. I'm to do that. i to figure out how to do this. <laughs> it moves, the, the continents move, they can crush against other continents uh, to fold uh, rocks on those continents and raise up mountains. Mountains rise on the surface when there is a root that is uh, su supporting them. Uh, and so I'm going to begin with, and so that's part of the moment, just the part that continents move. I'm going to begin with the evidence that continents have in fact moved in the past. One set of evidence are matching mineral deposits found on opposite sides of the current oceans, but not found in the oceans in between. So, for example, this is just an example. There are many examples here. It could take besides tin belts. But if you look for where tin is, uh, is found in high concentrations in the dark black, in lower concentrations in the uh, stippled, uh, and basically rare to non-existent in the white areas, uh, you've got these bands of uh, exposure of tin belts. And there is none, basically no tin in the oceans themselves, at least not appreciable amounts of it. But when you put these continents together into what we now understand to be Pangaea configuration, South America tucked into Africa, North America tucked up against Africa in the north, that the tin belts actually match up. Not just the belt itself, but even the high concentrations of the belts match across oceans, but absent in the ocean in between. That's interesting. And again, there's more evidence, more, uh, more mineral deposits than just tin, where this in fact shows up. And also, there's matching radiometric ages across oceans. The ocean basins in between turn out to be very young radiometrically, uh, only in the matter of tens to, uh, well really tens of millions of years, uh, up to at the most about 150 million years in age, but you'll find on the continents very much older ages in the in the range of billions of years. And again, the concentrations of extremely high, large rate ages actually match when we put the continents together uh, in pretty extraordinary ways. And again, it's completely different in the oceans in between. So it suggests that these continents, at least at one point, were together and they've moved to their current position. There's also another set of evidence. Again, these, each one of these is, category, is a category of evidence. There's multiple evidences around the world that confirm that. We have evidence of mountain belts, uh, folded mountains, that match when you put the continents together, but again, they're not found on the ocean floor. 
you've got ocean floor without these fold belts, but fold belts that are found across uh, Australia, Antarctica, South America actually match when you put the continents together. They're not found in the oceans in between. The, uh, another example, more familiar perhaps to us, are the matching mountains on either side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they don't exist in the ocean in between, but follow the Appalachian Mountains, uh, both the southern and the northern Appalachian Mountains. They come right up to the coast of North America. They're not found across the Atlantic Ocean, and they're picked up again in, uh, in Europe, in Scandinavia. <clears throat> My personal favorite, some paleontologists, I like the fossils, are uh, fossils that are found across the ocean, on either side of the ocean, but not in the ocean in between. Uh, so, and, and here we have an additional piece of information that suggests not just that the continents were once together, but this, are, this evidence actually indicates the continents were once apart, then came together, then parted again. And here's how it goes. The vertical striping indicates is reflecting rocks, Cambrian rocks, with a certain type, a whole suite of trilobites, known as North American province of trilobites. The horizontal striping is referring to the same aged rocks, same radiometric age in Europe, uh, that has also trilobites, but a different suite of trilobites, a recognizable, distinct suite of trilobites, which is the European province. So you have a North American province and a European province of trilobites. The last, on the very edge of the North American continent, like Nahant, Massachusetts, right? It's, a, it's an island, literally, in the ocean, uh, North America. Go there and look for trilobites. You find European trilobites over there. Like, what? What's going on here? And then there's, there are places in Europe where there are North American trilobites. But in each case, it's the, if you have North American trilobites in Europe, it's only on the far uh, western shores of Europe. And when you find the European trilobites in North America, it's only on the far eastern shores of North America. Suggesting, here's the reasoning, that there was a time when North America and, North America and Europe were separate, had different uh, trilobites buried on those continents. That was during the deposition of the Cambrian sediments. And then, after the deposition, the two continents came together, uniting, bringing together the North American, the European, the North American and European uh, in juxtaposition. And then the continents separated again along a similar, but not exactly the same line. Uh, thus leaving portions of Europe and North America, portions of North America on Europe, thus explaining the pattern, very strange pattern, uh, that comes to be very elegantly explained if, in fact, the continents have moved. We also have another type of evidence, our deformation evidences. This is uh, uh, New England and uh, up into Scandinavia, or in, into... Uh, into the Newfoundland area. We have all of these are fault lines, the orientations of fault lines. You, there's a lot of faults. Uh, there's, there's, New England has a lot of faults, but anyway. Uh, they, and they're, they're in lines. They line up uh, as if there was a crunching event that smashed into, uh, into North America and folded and broke uh, the North American continent uh, in, in a position basically perpendicular to the applied stress, as if, and so the argument would go, oh, that doesn't work, uh, is <laughs> Europe smashed into North America. I'm much too energetic, I guess. This technology is probably not going to work. There we go. Um, another set of evidence, again, multiple examples of this around the world, but here's one example. We have deltas that lack the source for the delta. So you've got a delta, which is debris that's being brought in, washed in, and accumulated, 
And so you see, wow, here's the delta stuff. We, where does it come from? It's coming from this direction. We can tell by currents that it's coming from, let's say, the west. So we go to the west to find its source. And alas, these crazy deltas, like here on North America, are sitting near the eastern shore of North America. The material's coming from the east. We go to the east to find out where it is, and we fall into the ocean. The ocean is not where deltas come from. <laughs> deltas are supposed to come from the land, go to the ocean. What is this? We've got huge, the Hamilton deposits in, in uh, uh, New York, uh, all up and down the East Coast, we have these enormous, I mean, huge deltas with lots of material coming from the ocean. What's going on here? It makes sense if, in fact, at the time those particular deltas were formed, there was a continent there for the source for that material uh, in, the case, in, in the form of Africa. Otherwise, how do you explain these crazy deltas that come out of nowhere? Uh, another very powerful piece of evidence, especially at the time this was being debated, uh, was we have glacial grooves deposited, exposed in various places around the world. Uh, we have rocks that have been scoured and exposed by glaciers. Glaciers carrying rocks in their base scrape the ground uh, and scrape into rocks, producing glacial grooves. And it's really cool if you go to these places, you can run your hand across the rock and you realize that one direction is rougher than the other direction. You can actually tell not just whether it's north-south, for example, but actually whether it's actually north or south. It's actually got a direction indicated by these grooves. So here we have, in South America, we have grooves and these are, we're looking only at rocks of a particular age uh, in other words, grooving that only occurred at a particular time in Earth history. And in, that per in those Permian rocks, we have grooves in South America of uh, the, the uh, uh, glaciers coming off the ocean onto the land? Really? How do you do that? <laughs> you know, they, don't they usually go the other way? <laughs> they come off the land, go to the ocean? Uh, we have them coming into south, uh, southern Australia, off the ocean. If that wasn't bad enough, the worst one, because these guys are coming off a kind of cold ocean anyway. But look at India. It's coming off of an equatorial ocean. Arr, how do you do that? And in Africa, we seem to have a source uh, where it moves away from a central location. That could make sense with these others. Ooh. But if you put the continents together, you actually have the source in Africa moving off, not onto the ocean, but onto India, explaining why the, the grooves come onto India. It explains why the grooves go on to South America. It explains why the grooves go, come on to Australia. You put the pieces together, and these things actually make sense. And then, the killer. This is the one that... <laughs> I have no idea how to explain this any other way. These are called... Uh, uh, polar wander curves. It was observed fairly early on that uh, sediments preserve, in some cases, the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field at the time the sediment was formed. So if you have any ma magnetic minerals, uh, anything with magnetic dipoles, and, and it's being carried, let's say, in water and settles down on the, uh, uh, the bottom of the ocean or whatever, they orient themselves in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And so when a rock is then formed from it, if you look at the whole rock and all of these minerals adding up their magnetic fields together, the rock has a magnetic field of its own. And it preserves the direction of the magnetic field at the time the rock was formed, which is very powerful in, terming, in determining what the latitude of a rock was at the time a rock was formed, because, uh, unless you don't know this, uh, if, you, if you have a, not a normal compass like you would uh, usually use to find where you're at, but a compass that allows the needle to go in, th in any direction, 360 degrees in all directions. If you put that, if you take that compass and uh, you're sitting at the uh, equator of the Earth, 
it, it does a normal thing, compass does. It points uh, to the North Pole in a horizontal fashion. But as you, let's say, start from the equator and move north, you'll notice that the needle dips, continues to, to point in the same direction northwise, but it begins to dip. And when you finally stand directly over the magnetic pole of the Earth, it's straight up and down. It's facing straight into the Earth. If you back up from the equator going south, it dips upward so that by the time you get to the southern pole, magnetic pole of the Earth, it faces straight up. So if you have a rock that was formed at 30 degrees north latitude, it's going to have, it should have, a magnetic field preserved in it that dips 30 degrees down into the ground. But alas, when we looked at, let's say, the pile of rocks in the Grand Canyon, and so we looked at rocks at the top, we see rocks, alas, they are, they're dipped at the, at the current latitude indicated uh, that, that the Grand Canyon is at. But as we, as we go back in time to the rocks deeper and deeper into the canyon, we find that the orientation changes, that there is a different position, different angle, as we go down, and sometimes a different orientation, suggesting that the continents moved, or, as was originally suggested, the pole moved. You could have the, I mean, obviously, continents don't move. I mean, come on. So, so an easier way to explain this was the pole, the pole wandered. The pole moved in the past. Uh, so that if you look at this a series of of rocks from the Grand Canyon, they determine the current position of the pole is here, but alas, if we tra trace it back in time, we see that the pole has moved from, let's see, this is North America, it, its current position is here, but as we go to older and older rocks, the pole was sitting somewhere in uh, Asia, uh, and all the way back in the Cambrian, it was sitting out in the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Cool, that's possible. Until we go to Europe and look at its polar wander curve, if Europe, if this is really the explanation of, of, the, of the pole's motion, then you would think that Europe should show the same pattern. But it doesn't. Europe shows a pattern that goes in a different direction. Ah, did you split the pole? Do you, you, mean, you mean Europe? can't see the pole that's over Europe, but can only see the pole that... But if you move the continents relative to one another, you can bring the polar wander curves together. And that allows you not just to indicate, oh, they were once here and they were once here, but you can actually trace the actual motion of the continents, latitude-wise anyway, uh, through time to bring all the polar wander curves into place. How else do you explain it? I mean, that's just wildly cool. You don't look like you're terribly interested. But anyway, um, okay, that brings us to the second part of the talk. Um, that was, those are some of the evidences that continents had moved in a particular way. But it was combined, as I said, in creating plate tectonics with a seafloor spreading idea. Concept here was that while continents were in fact moving, there's also this aspect of the mantle material is rising at a particular location. It is cooling as it uh, molten rock hits the water. It cools and then gets moved across the bottom of the ocean until it finally is pulled down into the mantle. And so as it does so, um, if that's a simple idea. That's the, that's the idea right there. From that idea, we can actually kind of predict what should happen? Hot material occupies more volume than cold material. So this material over here is colder because it's been exposed to the cold ocean longer than this material. So this stuff over here should be expanded more than this material. So it should sit higher than the material away from the what we call a mid-ocean ridge. The reason it's a ridge is because it's hot material. This is just, I'm just giving you theory right now. As it gets moved along, it shrinks, and so you should expect the ocean to actually deepen away from the ridge in both directions. Uh, and then, 
If it's being pulled down into the mantle, this is a rock, doggone it. It's being pulled into the mantle from a more or less horizontal position, and you're trying to bend the rock to bring it into the, into the uh, mantle. You're, you're going to go underneath the continental crust in such a way that you're going to leave a very deep area of the ocean right up against there. And you can't just do that bend immediately. That bend's going to have to start dozens, hundreds of miles away from the, away from this trench. And you're going to have an area which is unusually high, higher than if the, if, if you just cut off this and let it go back down to where it wants to be, it's going to be setting higher. This is going to produce more rock underneath this point relative to the center of the earth than it should, so there'll be more gravity there. There's going to be a gravitational uh, a high here. It's going to be a gravitational low in the trench because you have less rock than you should have because the rock is diving underneath the, the, uh, the continent and it's being replaced by water, which weighs, weighs less. So, oh, and, and the other thing is that this material that's in the mantle, if we, the, we've got some samples of that material. If you take that material in the laboratory and melt it, or better yet, partially melt it, begin to melt it, what happens is a portion of that material uh, melts out with a slightly different com chemical composition than the material was that you started with. In other words, the, the lower temperature minerals melt out or separate out. And what separates out when you cool it is a rock we call basalt. You can do this in the lab. So you would predict that mantle material partially melted should produce basalt. So this puppy, all of this should be basalt. And if you play around with it some more and you take basalt and you partially melt it, what will come out of it is something called andesite. So over here, when it begins to go into the mantle and begins to melt and comes up to the surface, it should come up as andesitic rock. So there are some predictions we could make there. Um, so the ocean should deepen away from the ridge. It should increase in radiometric age in age, away from the ridge, yes? And how fast is this stuff supposed to be moving? Oh, that's a different sort of, well, they, 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 that's a great question. I'm going to reserve that for Steve. Steve's going to answer that question. <laughs> um, the crust will increase in thickness as we get away from the ridge because it's cooling deeper and deeper and deeper as it moves away from the ridge. So the crust should thicken. The, um, the crust should decrease in heat flow. Heat that's uh, seeping through is seeping through a very thin crust near the ridge, and it's seeping through a thick crust, which is acting as an insulator away from the ridge. So heat flow, if you took a thermometer and ran along the bottom of the ocean, you should see less heat coming out away from the, uh, through the rocks as you get further and further away from the ridge. You'd also expect, now some of it is, Critters are making shells and, and debris is falling down in the ocean, piling on top of this crust. So the sediment on top of the crust should thicken as you get away from the ridge. Notice it's a simple idea, but look how many predictions it makes about the world. Also, I already referred to the gravity high because this is going to be higher than it ought to be. Water is replacing rock here, so there should be a gravity low right at the trench. Should be a gravity high just seaward of the trench. When it comes to earthquakes, which are uh, brittle rock moving against brittle rock, where would we expect them? Well, we might expect some earthquakes here at the mid-ocean ridge, but they're not going to be very deep because the crust is brittle only at the very surface. So you've only got very shallow earthquakes here, and there's a difference in an earthquake that's caused by rocks moving apart from one another, as opposed to rocks moving towards each other, as, a rocks, as opposed to rocks moving side by side. So you would expect extensional earthquakes, stretching earthquakes that are shallow at the ridge. You would expect uh, compressional earthquakes, 
as the crust is, is moving against the continent, you would have cons compressional earthquakes at the trench, and these earthquakes will deepen uh, landward of the trench following the plate that is subducting, falling into the mantle. Um, and then there's the transform faults, and I'll get back to that, which is really cool. Now, if you happen to have holes in the, uh, in the crust, places where mantle material is punching its way through the ocean crust, what should be produced are volcanoes that are made of basalt. And those volcanoes are going to be transported along this thing as time goes along, and they'll eventually move off of whatever the source of heat was, and so they'll become extinct. And since the ocean is deepening, they will drop beneath the waves and be these flat top, once exposed to the surface, volcanoes that get deeper and deeper uh, uh, beneath the surface as you go away from the ridge. And when you melt the material here at the, uh, at the subducting plate, comes up, produces volcanoes, it's going to produce andesitic volcanoes because that's what you get when you partially melt basalt. And these andesitic volcanoes will be landward of the trench, paralleling the trench. Um, this is cool. Look at all these predictions. Okay, so let's look and see what happens with these predictions. Here's an awful picture of the bottom of the ocean. Uh, but uh, what, we have, what we have here are, um, if you can recognize this, Africa and Europe and Asia, North America, South America. So all this is the ocean stuff. Uh, what we see, first of all, is that there is a ridge, there's a mountain range that runs through the oceans. This would correspond to the mid-ocean ridges. So this is the mid-ocean ridge system of the, of the world. Uh, it runs through the southern and eastern portion of the Pacific Ocean, goes right straight in between, halfway in between Australia and Antarctica, right through the middle of the Indian Ocean, up into the Red Sea, up through the Jordan River Valley. Um, that's Jordan River Valley is a rift system. And uh, there's another one that goes through the very middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There's the mid-ocean ridge system. So we do have such high points on the bottom of the ocean. And these are the trenches of the world, um, roughly speaking. There's one, a big one, along the uh, western coast of South America. Uh, just to the south of the Aleutian Islands and uh, just to the east of Japan, Kamchatka and those places and all over the place in the uh, Indonesian Islands and the South Sea Island areas. Um, now here's ocean depth. Remember the prediction is getting away from the, uh, the ridge you should increase in ocean depth. Here is the South Pacific in blue, the North Pacific in red, distance from the uh, ridge, which in this case is measured by millions of years, but it's also physically measured as a distance from the ridge. What's interesting is this black line is not the best fit through the data. This is a line you get when you take molten basalt and let it cool. And how does the volume change? Thus, what do you predict should be the change in, uh, in depth of the ocean as a function of time? That's cool. <laughs> Okay, islands uh, in the ocean exposed at the surface, we can actually date those rocks directly. When you look at the islands that are sitting right on the ridge, for example, Iceland, you've got very young radiometric ages. When you get farther away, get far enough away from the ridge, you've got very old radiometric ages. Uh, there's a, there, islands increase in age with their distance away. We've poked a few holes in the ocean. Uh, a lot more than this indicates at this point. This is taken off a number of years ago. But from those holes, we have taken cores and we've dated those rocks. And here's basically the age of the sediments. This is a long time ago. There's more data filling in some of these gaps. But the black indicates very young ages. The, uh, then as we move away towards the stipple, it gets, uh, gets older and older ages. So there's some young thing running right through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and it's older on either side in a symmetric fashion. Does that look familiar? That's the mid-ocean ridge. That's the mid-Atlantic ridge. And there's, an old, there's a young thing coming right down the eastern part of the Pacific and the southern part of the Pacific, getting older as you get away. 
That's the, that's the Pacific Ridge system. There's one in between uh, Australia and Antarctica. That's cool. One that runs right up through into the Red Sea. That's the ridge system. It's exactly what you'd predict. This is wild. You could take a magnetometer uh, and, and run it along the bottom of the ocean and pick up slight variations in the Earth's magnetic field. If a rock was formed uh, and has its own magnetic field, and these basalts do, they have some magnetic minerals, so they themselves produce a magnetic field of their own. And obviously when it's formed, it's formed in the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field. So if you run a magnetometer over that rock, you're going to find a slightly higher, the stronger magnetic field than would be the case if that rock was non-magnetic. Okay, so the average magnetic field at that point, you know what it should be. Alas, this rock's got a greater magnetic field. It indicates that it was formed, the rock was formed, when the Earth's magnetic field was in the same orientation as the rock. But let's say the Earth's magnetic field is flipped. I have reason to believe that it was. It has flipped in the past. In that case, the rock has a, a magnetic field in the opposite direction as the current magnetic field, and it will cause a, uh, a magnetic anomaly in the negative direction. It'll make a, a weaker magnetic field over that point. So here we have a, a picture, three, a two-dimensional picture, of one area on either side of, uh, to the south uh, west of Iceland, on either side of the mid-ocean ridge. This is a picture of the gravity, uh, the magnetic positive anomalies are in black, and the negative anomalies are in, in blue. So we have a ridge with a positive anomaly here, and on either side of it, there's a negative anomaly, and then a positive anomaly, and a negative anomaly. This is much more dramatic if we actually look at individual, so the ship that's moved across the started um, um, uh, 400 kilometers away from the ridge, goes to the ridge, across the ridge, and ends 400 kilometers on the other side of the ridge. Um, this is, these are three different runs across the ridge with a grip, uh, with a gravimeter. Oops. This is amazing. Look at the ridge. Look at the symmetry. Then there's a bump, and there's a, and there's another sharp bump, and then there's a broad bump with a sharp bump. Let's go. Then there's a double tooth, or a triple tooth, actually. Then there's a double tooth, double broad tooth. And then there's a, a, a sharp tooth and a broad one. That's wild. <laughs> okay, how do you do that if you don't, you know, they, they've got the same, these two things have the same signature because at one time they were formed at the, uh, at the ridge and have been separated from each other. That explains it beautifully. How else do you explain that? It's amazing. Here's heat flow as a function of distance. High heat flow close to the ridge uh, and low heat flow away from the ridge. Gravity anomalies. Uh, you've got high gravity, uh, <coughs> gravity highs, uh, uh, seaward of the trenches. Here's the trench, here's the trench here. And gravity lows in the trench, just what you would expect. Um, and there's also this ridge that is running through the uh, ocean, is displaced, gets displaced in places along faults, that when you look at it on a map, on a two-dimensional map, you think, why are they curved? They're not curved if you see it in three dimensions, if you see it on a sphere, the sphere of the Earth. If you move two plates apart on a spherical Earth, uh, they move, the, the fault lines are quite straight. But if you then take those, that, that, three, that spherical earth and then and throw that onto a flat map, it makes it look like those faults are curved. Uh, so we, we can actually explain the curvature of the faults in the ocean. Uh, earthquakes, now here's, just take this off of the, off the internet, uh, a year's worth of earthquakes in a year. <laughs> it's a lot of earthquakes all over the, but notice, there's areas where not very many earthquakes actually occur. Earthquakes are in bands, uh, in places where we believe plates are interacting with other plates. Notice 
the line of earthquakes down the middle of the Indian Ocean between Australia and Antarctica through the southern and eastern uh, uh, ocean of Pacific, and then down the middle of the Atlantic. What's that look like? Those are the ridges, aren't they? They're following the ridges. What about all these earthquakes? Those are where the, the, uh, the subduction, the, the trenches are. Okay, now let's take away all of the shallow earthquakes. <laughs> You've disappeared. All of the, all of the, tr all of the ridges are gone. So all ridges have shallow earthquakes only. Okay, all you have left are the deeper earthquakes in the deeper portion of the trenches. It gets even better when you look more closely. Here's Japan, not a place to live if you don't like earthquakes. Um, here's a two-dimensional map view. Let's turn it on its side and look at these earthquakes as de with depth. You got Japan and China and the, uh, the sea between them. Uh, most of the earthquakes aren't actually on the surface. They deepen uh, land, uh, landward of Japan. The trench is sitting out here. So the shallowest earthquakes are in the trench. The deepest earthquakes move underneath, uh, deeper and deeper underneath the continent. Uh, you've got uh, Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii has got the youngest radiometric ages of any of the Hawaiian islands, the big, the big uh, island. And as you move to the northwest, the age of the islands increases, and then they disappear. Ah, only on the surface. If you go underneath the surface, you find buried islands. Uh, again, flat-topped islands that get deeper and deeper, and radiometrically older and older and older and older, uh, all the way to 70 million years in radiometric ages as you go away, which is what you predict with that crust that is decrease that is uh, shrinking because of its cool because it's cooling and there's volcanoes where do we have andesitic volcanoes all the blue is andesitic volcanoes here are the trenches um, you got a trench here and andesitic volcanoes landward of the trenches you got a trench there underneath the Aleutians the Aleutians are andesitic volcanoes uh, you got a trench landward of Japan Japan is in basically andesitic volcanoes this is really cool. And there's a big tr trench there to the west of South America. And on the and landward of that is a mountain chain known as the Andesite. We named the rock Andesite because it comes from the Andes Mountains. And that's a one of these, these uh, volcanoes a set of volcanoes landward of the trench. This is cool stuff. Now here is the clincher. Here's the one. The United States, the US geologists wouldn't accept plate tectonics for the longest time. They fought it for 50 years. And primarily because we got this thousand mile wide mountain chain that just doesn't seem to fit, but that's another story that's kind of fun. Um, but the, in 1964, a prediction was made in a, in a paper that says if plate tectonics is true, then we would expect something, a very peculiar prediction is made about earthquakes on the seafloor. And that is, let's say we have the mid-ocean ridge, but we have the mid-ocean ridge, as I said, in places it's displaced, as kind of set off, the offset, and then the ridge continues. Now, that's what it looks like from the map. So, think of this as a railroad. Okay, now if you saw this on the uh, on the land, and uh, you're saying, "What happened here?" What would you say happened? There was an earthquake, right, that separated the uh, the two two pieces of the uh, of the track. And which direction did the land move? If you were standing over here and looking this way, what direction did that track move relative to you? moves to the right. Okay, this is called a right uh, right slip fault. It's moving to the right, you say, but you know, it depends on how you look at it. Well, stand over here. Look down this way. This puppy would go to the right, okay? I mean, it, right? It would make, it makes sense. And let's say there was a house over here, and you were standing here at the time of the earthquake. Would the house have moved? If the, if the two, you know, the two, uh, uh, if there's one track and the house is next to it, 
and then this earthquake occurred, both the track and the house would move, right? So you would expect motion along the entire fault, and it would be a right strike-slip fault. That's what you would expect. It looks like that. But if plate tectonics is true, and these are places where material is being formed and moving away at the same rate on either side, then material over here is being produced and moving this way, material is moving this way, so over here, both of them are moving at the same rate, so you expect no faulting on the outside of the trenches. So material is moving here, moving here, it's moving at the same rate over here, so there should be no motion over here. There should only be motion in between the two faults. And which direction is it going to be going? You're standing here, and you're looking at somebody that's standing right here. Which direction are they moving? Left. Cool. Stand here and look this way. They're moving left. Plate tectonics predicts that earthquakes are only going to be found, found between the ridges and going in the opposite direction as you would think. That's really cool. That was a prediction made within the year. They had verified that on the ocean, and that settled it. <laughs> there was nothing anyone could do but fall for this. I mean, well, it's to accept this uh, idea that, in fact, uh, plate tectonics is the way to explain a significant amount of geology on the planet. I mean, it's incredible. The shapes of the continents, I didn't even mention that. The you know, continents fit together. Uh, the ocean, the trans-ocean geology and paleontology I spoke briefly of. We've even measured continental motions and seen that the continents are moving with respect to one another. It's really cool. We've got compressional mountain belts that indicate things that boom, crunch together and they can be traced across oceans where they don't exist. Offset, offshore sediment sources, Permian glaciation stuff, that's grooves that come off of the oceans, off of a, off of a, a, a semi-tropical ocean. Polar wander curves, are you kidding? I don't know how else to explain those puppies than this. Um, the, the composition of volcanoes, the fact that the entire ocean crust is basalt, and that it's basalt volcanoes, the Hawaii is a basalt volcano. Um, that's what you find in the oceans, and then these these uh, uh, anacidic volcanoes landward of the trenches. Wow, that's incredible. The ocean depth, the where the ridges and the trenches are, the parallel ages on either side of the uh, increasing age on either side of the the, uh, uh, the ridges, the magnetic striping on either side. That's got an astonishing uh, connection. Heat flow, uh, gravity anomalies, um, the submergence of seamounts. Where earthquakes, I didn't mention the earthquake, but the ex they're extensional faults in the, in the uh, mid-ocean ridges. They're compressional faults in, the, in the, uh, the, the trenches. It's just, wow, what do you do with this? Uh, so the, the sum of the matter is plate tectonics is an extremely powerful theory. It explains a lot of geology. It's like, well, what can you do with this? You got to... And that's when I, when I was taking the classes in this, I said, man, it's got to be true, but the continents move at the rate that fingernails grow. And the radiometric ages are in tens of millions of years. Something's right, but something's wrong with the theory. And here we go. We go into the next, the next chapter. It's your turn, Steve.